I'm Michael Angioni. This is Matt Fuer. We are both senior software developers at Liferando. So Liferando is the German subsidiary of Takeaway.com, uh, which is based in, in Berlin. Takeaway.com is based instead uh, in the Netherlands and owns more or less 12, 13 companies all over Europe and Israel. So I work in the logistics department, which is called Scubar. Uh, it is based in Berlin uh, completely, but we operate in all uh, countries. We, we serve all countries. Matt works in the front end team instead. Uh, it has two offices in Berlin, of course, and in Enschede uh, in the Netherlands. And the job is to uh, mainly uh, work on the customer facing uh, web application. So yeah. Matt. Thank you. Um, so we want to give you some metrics just so you can have a frame of reference for the, the scale of the business that we're operating with. Um, so we processed, uh, in, in quarter three of 2019, we processed uh, almost 42 million orders um, while supporting almost 44,000 restaurants online. And we experienced 87% growth with the number of orders from Q3 of 2018 to 2019. And actually, that number is higher in Germany. It's at 136%. And you can attribute some of that to uh, a key acquisition that we had. We acquired Delivery Hero Germany earlier in the year. So that means that we've processed over 113 million orders to date which means that we're well on our way to 150 million orders uh, for the year, which is the name of this talk. Um, so what are we going to cover in this talk? So first, uh, Michele is going to talk about the logistics team at, at Takeaway, which we call Scuba. Um, he's going to talk about managing our delivery drivers, and he's going to give us a little primer in domain-driven design. Um, then I will come back and I will talk about the front end team, more specifically the migration project that we're working on. And we'll talk about uh, redesigning the front end architecture, the differences between the old stack versus the new stack. Um, and we'll also talk about some concepts such as back end for front end as well as a design system. So, with that, I'll hand it over to Michele. So, thanks, Matt. So I said I work in the logistics team, which is called Scuba. So Scuba is the merge of two words, uh, scooter and Uber, which in Dutch means uh, waiter. So our job uh, is to provide a delivery service for restaurants based on our employed drivers. So when Scuba was first created, it was a bit more of an experiment to us to enter a market that was, as I said, new. That means that a small team of a few developers with a limited budget had to create the complete infrastructure from scratch. So, but we face many challenges every day. So we need to forecast the number of drivers needed in every city and in every hour. We need, based on these numbers and the available drivers that we have, to create the driver shifts. We need to take care about the leaves of the drivers, so sick leaves, uh, vacation leaves, uh, free leaves. We have to get the customer orders in real time and to assign to each one of them the best available driver in that moment in that city. We, we have to drive our drivers, we guide our drivers uh, throughout the city, first to the restaurant and then to the customer. But we want also to provide our customers with a real-time food tracker so that they can see the food coming to their home. Eventually, we have also to pay the drivers the right amount, which can seem straightforward. But when you operate in so many countries with so many laws, uh, regulation, regulation, I can assure you this is everything but easy. So how can we start designing such infrastructure from scratch? At the very beginning, when you uh, enter a new market uh, or you found a new company, um, you have to, to keep in mind the business requirements will change very fast. Uh, service boundaries are not even so clear, and furthermore, often you have a limited amount for, for your DevOps operations. 
So in Scuba, uh, we started building a few monoliths, which is not uh, absolutely uh, strange and uncommon. And that was a good choice. I mean, a monolith can, allows you to explore the complexity of a system and the component boundaries. Then, as, as complexity rises, you can start breaking out microservices. And you can continue breaking out microservices as your knowledge on the market and the, the, the business rules inside it uh, improves. The problem is that after some time, uh, we can have several problems uh, making our uh, infrastructure evolve. However, it's pretty clear nowadays that switching to a microservice infrastructure brings several advantages. The first one is separation of concerns. Every microservice takes care of a particular service. You have loose couplings among them. That leads to a better maintainability. So every service can be developed, deployed independently by different teams, uh, maybe using different technologies. Uh, you have modularity. So loose coupling allows you to add and remove microservices without affecting, affecting the general health of the system. You can experiment. Let's say you have to build a new microservice. You can try out a new programming language, new design patterns, etc. Find, find out which ones fit you most, and then maybe refactor all microservices with the new tools that you have discovered. Um, you can, of course, um, have better scaling. That means that every microservice can scale autonomously, and you can have some resilience to failures. So, Ideally, the failure of one microservice shouldn't affect the, the health of the other microservices that should continue working. The problem, as I was saying before, is that it's very easy, after some time, without a proper design, uh, to end up in a very messy situation, like this one. And that was exactly what was happening uh, starting to happen uh, in Scuba. We realized that we needed a way to design our infrastructure in order to scale uh, without avoiding to, to end up in a mess like this, but having more something like this. So the question, of course, is how? So nowadays, many companies rely on domain-driven design not only to build a proper and efficient software architecture, but also to gain a better insights into their own business model and uh, uh, business rules. So let's review together the basic concepts of domain-driven design and how domain-driven design is helping Scuba on its goal, on its mission. So let's start with, uh, with some, some terminology. So the domain is the reality that we inhabit. So the market and all the business rules. Let's review a sketch, uh, a small part of the domain of, of Scuba. So our domain can be split in subdomains, of course. We can have a very big IT subdomain, a customer service and a, and a sales uh, subdomain. Of course, general subdomains can be further uh, split into smaller ones. So inside our IT, we have the shift planning subdomain, dispatching, router, business intelligence, and, uh, and so on. On the other hand, a business model is an abstraction of our domain that we use to represent it when building the software architecture. And it must be built in cooperation between the technical expert and the business experts. So in order to empower managers, developers, QAs, product people, etc., to shape the business and ultimately the software architecture, they all need to agree to a common terminology, to a com common set of names, etc. In, in, in domain-driven design, this is called ubiquitous language. By definition, ubiquitous language is a shared set of concepts, terms, definitions between the business stakeholders and the technical staff. So, in Scuba, we had many problems with, with our terminology, not only when product people and developers were speaking each other, but also inside the developer's team as well. A couple of examples. So the driver shifts were called both shifts and planning. But planning is referred to the whole, whole process of the, of the creation of the shifts. And shifts was uh, referred to be the availability of the driver in one of our applications, uh, and so on. So we needed to create our ubiquitous language. So we sat down, and we decided the definition of our concepts to spread to spread them amongst the team. So one of the easiest, but also more effective ways to do so 
to literally write down a glossary of concepts of terms of definitions, one sentence long, that uh, must be spread among the team. That, uh, at this point, all specification, documentation, also application, and testing code must, be, must uh, use this ubiquitous language. That was not on the only problem that we had at Scuba. So Scuba grew a lot in the last years. So less than three years ago, Scuba was around 10 people. Now we are hitting the second zero. So that immediate, uh, very fast growth uh, led, of course, the, uh, the soft architecture to not have clear separation of concern. It was everything a bit mixed up, and we were hiring like crazy. So we needed to gain a better knowledge of our own domain. Uh, we decided then to use one of the most important tools of domain-driven design, that is context mapping. So the ultimate goal is to uh, build our, uh, uh, our domain model. That means divide our domain in bounded contexts and understand the relationship between them. So a bounded context is an independent area of our domain where certain business rules apply and a certain ubiquitous language is used. So ideally, a bounded context has the same span of a subdomain, but as I said, this is the ideal situation. So more often you have more bounded contexts inside the subdomain or they could not overlap entirely. So in, uh, in Scuba, then we decided to have more sessions of event storming. Event storming uh, allow, allows uh, developers and product people to understand the domain or, or where you work and to build a proper uh, domain model. This also uh, helped us to split the Scuba team into uh, sub-teams. So now we have one sub-team dedicated uh, to, a, to a particular subdomain. And often, uh, many of these sub-teams are even smaller than a famous two-pizza team of Jeff, Jeff Bezos. Um, coming down to the implementation, of course, one bounded context can, can be composed of one or more microservices. But the important thing is to understand the basic entities of a bounded context, and domain-driven design provides you a series of tools and best practices to do that. The, the ideal situation is that only when you have a good knowledge of your domain, you can start really writing down your implementation uh, or start refactoring that, home, as we did in Scuba. So this is all good in practice, but of course, everything uh, could fall apart if we don't follow a series of, of best practice when really writing down our software uh, architecture. Let's review some of them, and let's see how we apply them inside Scuba. So when we started this process of refactoring, actually our synchronous APIs were already in a pretty decent situation. Most of them followed all REST uh, um, best, practice, best practices and rules. We just needed to stick more to that and be more uh, careful to follow all best practices. We also started to write our uh, GraphQL endpoints. Asynchronous communication was instead a bit a wild mess. First of all, we had two different message brokers. We had RabbitMQ and Kafka which made no sense. So we migrated all our RabbitMQ code to Kafka. Second of all, we had really no standards for, for the payload of, of, each of our event payloads. Um, fortunately, some standards are starting to arise in the community, so we, sticked, we chose and stick to the cloud event standards, which aims to f exactly to, uh, to provide a, a format, um, a standard for the payload of events. Um, our events, uh, synchronous communication. So let's come to authentication. As all of you know, authentication is pretty central in a software architecture, and sooner or later, all developers will have to, to touch it. The problem is that there is no unique way to build a, uh, authentication in a software architecture. The best advice I can give you is to not rely on homemade solutions. And it's really, really easy, also for very experienced developers, to, 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 put, to insert security issues. In general, also here, following industry standards, so use token-based authentication, uh, HTTP-only cookies, et cetera. And whenever possible, our suggestion is to use, uh, to adopt uh, cloud-based solutions. I will give you here a history. At a certain point, inside the Scuba architecture, we had three different ways to authenticate our applications and our users. We had Google authentication, we had some key clock instances, 
um, uh, uh, etc. So we decide uh, as a first step to, to use a cluster, a self-hosted cluster of Keycloak. Well, that seemed a good solution at first, but we had two problems. So the first problem is reliability. So it was not as reliable as we wanted it to be. The second problem is that uh, we wanted, at a certain point, to standardize the authentication, not only Scubar, but in whole takeaway.com. So eventually, it was taken this decision to use uh, a cloud-based Okta. Uh, this is a, still an ongoing process, so I, can, I cannot still tell the, the happy ending, because we are uh, still working on that. But we are in, in the successful process of migrating first to Keycloak inside our Scubar, and then to move as a second step to, to Okta. Um, I've spoken a bit about authentication, that means understanding who the user is. At the, same time, at the same time, we want also to review our authorization mechanism. That means understanding what the user can do. And we decided to uniform it using a simple but very popular role-based access control. So one way to approach to implement this approach is to take uh, your API, understanding which roles, can, which uh, actions can be performed uh, to the API, uh, and assign to each one of them a permission. At that point, you need to understand the roles, the different roles that a user have when accessing your APIs, and then you need to assign to each role a set of actions that can be performed, that is the set of um, uh, permissions. Eventually, you have to assign one or more roles to each one of your users, maybe during the process of user registration. About errors, well, that's another point where we had to, to work a lot. So we, we soon realized that relying only on uh, HTTP status code is not enough to safely communicate to the user which kind of errors our API had. So it's a good practice to, to, to include your API response a, a, an error code. It's also very important to define a clear format for all your error messages of your API to standardize it throughout your whole API. Uh, I can tell you that more than once we broke a front-end application because it was expecting a different format for error message. It's very important, of course, to, to log all internal errors to cloud and specialized solutions because it's really, really useful to, to perform advanced searches uh, to your logs and, of course, to keep them persistent, uh, persistent to, uh, to a long period of time. So, so we also reviewed recently our alerting strategy. So it's really important to, to adopt an alerting strategy to, to, to prompt a real-time action when a real internal error happens, even before clients or customers notify you. So in general, it doesn't matter how big and how small you are, uh, things are going to change. A business requires change, and eventually you, are, you will have to, to modify your API. The goal, of course, is not to break your clients, whether your clients are internal, uh, internal teams, other teams, or external customers, it doesn't matter. So we were doing pretty well in Scuba. Uh, for synchronous APIs, uh, we were using either versioning directly in the domain, so after the main domain, the, directly in the URL, or as a query string or authentication or in a header of the request. Um, it can be versioning, can follow semantic versioning or to be a timestamp as Amazon Web Services use it. But the point is that at that time, we understood that we needed to version also our asynchronous communication. Therefore, you can use version directly in the topic or queue name, or even better, to put the version in the event payload. I guess that most of you are developers like me. So that means that we really love when we find a library or third-party API with outstanding documentation. The truth is that we hate spending time writing down the documentation. Um, it's clear that having doc good documentation is really important. And that especially to guarantee maintainability in the medium and long term of a certain API, maybe when all the developers of the API have already left the team. So it's also important uh, to keep the documentation of all versions of your API and to store documentation online so that's always available to both the developers and the clients. About testing, 
we could give an entire conference about testing. I will just give you a, a couple of advices. Uh, in Scuba, you use, of course, different environment. Okay, we have the live environment. We have, of course, a staging environment where we test our, our new features. We have a load testing environments, and we have also another environment, more than once, uh, to, be the, to say the truth, where we can test uh, new features in isolations. Some of our applications use uh, blue-green uh, deployments. That means having a second uh, production environment, uh, same them equal to the real environment, production environment with a new version of your application, and to direct 10% uh, of the traffic, let's say, uh, to, the new, uh, to, the new, to the new version. If no wanted behavior is seen, you can start rising uh, the traffic uh, until you get 100%. In order to avoid regressions, I mean, it's obvious, test automation is becoming more and more important. From one part, from one side, when I speak about test automation, I speak about a unit, integration, contract, and end-to-end -end tests. And the developers of the API should take care directly in care of building these tests. But as we are moving towards an event-driven architecture, and there is the need of testing not only one single API, but the, com the complete architecture. The co and maybe not only the team, but also of the company. So we recently built a QA team, specialized QA team, that builds test automation uh, throughout the complete uh, architecture. So um, as you can imagine, there is work going on. We have a lot of work. We need to scale. But doing that, we need also to guarantee that our infrastructure is always secure, efficient, and reliable. So now Matt is going to tell you about the migration uh, project they are going through. Uh, yep, here it is. Thank you, Michele. Yep, so as Michele said, I'm Matt and I work on the front end team. Uh, more specifically, I work on the consumer web project where we work to migrate to a new stack. And I'm going to tell you the story about um, how we do that. And I um, just want to clarify that when I say front end, I don't just mean HTML and CSS. Um, you know, we're building servers, we're working with Docker and Kubernetes, we're querying the database. Um, so most of us are full stack engineers. Um, so this is the web application for Lee Ferrando. Um, and I feel like I should give you some backstory because this, this application is over 15 years old. Um, we've had a lot of acquisitions over the years. And this application uh, processes tens of millions of orders a year. Um, but you know we had difficulty scaling the architecture. And we didn't always make the best software design decisions. And um, we had to make compromises, which ultimately added to our code debt. Um, so yeah, we built upon this monolith more and more until um, we uh, have what we have today. Um, yeah, so the current stack, PHP and jQuery. I know, not the most cutting edge of names. Um, but you need to remember that this is a 15-year-old application, and that's, uh, that was the foundation of what they started with. Um, but yeah, we have built a distributed monolith. Um, and we all know some of the issues with uh, monoliths, such as scaling. It's hard to make releases. Um, we didn't have a uh, bulletproof uh, framework in place. Um, we had uh, different configurations between dev environments. Um, we had to rely on Babel to use ES6. Um, and then other things, like we had uh, front-end teams in Germany and in the Netherlands. So that uh, required a lot of aligning and communication all the time. And there was not really a clear separation between the front-end and the back-end in the code base. So we have these tightly coupled contexts, right? Uh, within this monolith. We have you know, cron script logic. We have logic regarding the checkout process, database queries, login and registration. And it's all very tightly coupled. And this is uh, something we, we want to try and break apart. But it's, it's been a bit difficult because of how uh, far the code base has grown. So we end up playing a game like this, where you, you change the 
the code in one place and you have a bug pop up in the other place. You know, so you end up playing a game of developer whack-a-mole. Um, you know, but this, this really slowed down development time and it made us so that we had to spend more time uh, fixing bugs than developing new features. And that was uh, something we wanted to change. Um, another issue we had is we were dealing with a, a legacy API that served XML. Um, and basically, uh, to spare you the history lesson, basically what happened is uh, we had to um, have the current website and the legacy XML API uh, functioning in tandem because you know, the, the mobile apps use the legacy API as well. Um, so what we had to do is for every new feature we implemented in the current website, we'd also have to implement, implement it in the legacy API. And this is something, of course, that is not good for scalability. So we wanted to fix this. Um, and then we wanted to you know, just improve on the overall uh, design structure of it all. Um, this is an uh, image I took from a talk by Brad Frost, the author of Atomic Design. And this isn't from Lee Ferrando, but um, you know, it shows that when you don't have a centralized, aligned design framework, you could potentially end up with something like this, where you have buttons with all different shapes and sizes and fonts and widths. Um, so we, we felt like we could improve on this as well. So how are we going to fix these things? Well, enter the, come on, <laughs> the consumer web project. Um, so what this was is uh, the company came together and we decided, okay, it's time to uh, rebuild this front end. Um, so yeah, we referred to this as the migration project and as I was building the slide, I thought, you know, this sounds pretty epic, so I might as well slap on a really epic looking picture, um, you know, because that's sometimes what it feels like when you're working on it, you're doing something really important. But seriously, what is the goal of the Consumer Web Project? It's to create a new front end application with modern technologies which will enable it to scale, be data driven, and create small and efficient teams focused on specific business domains. Um, there were some areas we uh, definitely wanted to improve on, aside from what I mentioned earlier. We wanted to improve our time to market. We wanted to be able to deploy more easily and quickly. Um, we wanted the uh, website to be more performant. Um, uh, we wanted it to be more secure and stable. And we wanted to be able to more easily implement A-B testing so that we could make data-driven decisions about the UI and the way our uh, users are interacting with the website. And of course, we want to decouple all the services I mentioned earlier so that we can scale um, with clear separation of business domains. So the stack. I'm really excited about this stack because I'm a JavaScript guy. And as you can see, these are all JavaScript technologies. Um, React and Redux Saga on the front end. Um, React because it's battle tested and scales so well. Um, Sagas because they allow us to organize uh, the side effects within our application in a, a, a clear and uh, organized way. Um, we're also using Next.js so we can get all the benefits from server side rendering. Um, like improved search engine optimization and isomorphic JavaScript code and uh, faster load times. Because we still have users that are using uh, Internet Explorer, right? So we want to be able to improve the experience for them too. And we can do that with server-side rendering. And of course, Node.js, which works so well with these technologies. So. What about this legacy XML API thing? How are we going to uh, handle this, this issue? Well, we decided to implement a pattern called backend for frontend, or BFF. Um, this is a uh, pattern that was first proposed by Sam Newman, who's actually doing a talk later today, and we're really excited about it. Um, but so what is a backend for frontend? Um, I took this definition from uh, the Microsoft documentation, and what it says is a backend for front end is one backend per user interface. The BFF team fine tunes the behavior and performance of each backend 
to best match the needs of the front-end environment without worrying about affecting other front-end experiences. Um, so yeah, so basically what it is, is for each front-end application, you have a specific uh, back-end for that front-end application, right? Uh, so we avoid basically having one back-end for every front-end interface, say uh, the web app, the iOS app, and the Android app, right? We want to we wanna separate that out so each one of those interfaces has its own back-end. Um, it would only contain client-side logic, and uh, there's some clear wins here, right? We uh, provide separate functionality for the mobile apps and the web apps, and uh, we're able to shield the back end and the front end from each other's change requests. So the, uh, the BFF uh, functions as a translation layer, and uh, this results in no conflicting update requirements. So uh, this is an image that I took from Sam Newman's website. Um, this is so typically when uh, you're building a, uh, a web application, for example, you build the back end and the front end in tandem, right? And that's fine. Um, as your company scales and you get more users, you decide you want to add a mobile application. And you decide that that mobile application is going to share the back end with the desktop. And that might be OK. That might, be, uh, that might suffice for your business needs. Um, but once the needs of the mobile team start to differ and diverge from the needs of the web team, that's when you might uh, want to start thinking about implementing something like a backend for front end. Um, so what we were going to do, we were going to build the consumer web um, with the consumer web team. And we also have a specific uh, BFF team that we work with very closely. And we would slip that uh, right in between our calls to the legacy XML API. And uh, that would essentially obfuscate uh, all of those concerns from uh, the consumer web. We don't have to worry about communicating with this legacy uh, XML API. We don't have to worry about this uh, unreadable XML. Um, BFF will take care of all of that. And that's a, a huge win for us, um, that we're able to not have to worry about that logic. Um, so this is kind of the ideal high-level overview of what we're going for um, with this migration project. Um, so you can see uh, Consumer Web is over here. Um, and right now, so we have our Consumer Web team and our BFF team, um, which are uh, we're, we're building these apps in tandem. And so we would make calls to the back end for front end, and then the back end for front end would take care of uh, making calls to the various internal microservices within the company. Um, and we also see this little design system up here, and we'll definitely get to that shortly. Um, so yeah, what were some challenges that our BFF team was facing? Um, well, they. They had to do status quo discovery in parallel with anticipatory changes with the back end, which basically means that as they're building the back end for front end, uh, the, the back end team's needs will kind of make things change, and they will have to you know, stay agile and um, keep working with the back end team. Um, they might have to reevaluate and re-engineer some of our dependencies. For example, our uh, translation API. Um, basically, the way that the current website is uh, consuming our translations uh, wasn't, it, it, it's not the, the best way to implement for uh, this new JavaScript implement, uh, application that we're building. So they had to figure out another way to do that. Um, and of course, you know, and because we're both building these applications, the back end for front end and the consumer web at the same time, uh, we, have to, we both have to push this development, and that means that they're going to have to iterate a lot. They might have to change their old solutions um, and sometimes do rework. But that's, that's just how it is. 
Um, but there are some, some wins. Uh, like, despite um, working on a major migration project, um, because of the way that we're approached implementing this um, application, we don't have to worry about breaking the existing uh, current app uh, website. Um, so we can experiment with things, and we don't have to worry about how that'll affect the current website. And of course, we, we get human-readable JSON from our, uh, our XML API, which you know, is better for debugging, it's better for discovery, and practicality in general. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, sidestep back to this image, um, because you know this getting involved in this uh, this migration project uh, gave us an opportunity to um, implement a uh, a centralized design framework for the company. Um, a, a pilot program, if you will, which is how uh, Brad Frost described it. Um, so yeah, we want to implement a design system, and that's currently what we're working on. So you can search the internet, and you'll find various definitions for what a design system is, um, but this is my definition. A complete set of design standards, documentation, UI patterns, and components. Design systems allow you to manage design at scale. So basically, you have uh, this team that's uh, basically uh, building this application, um, which has uh, various parts to it. And included in the system is things like typography, fonts, uh, layouts, colors, icons, uh, reusable components, um, coding conventions, and documentation amongst other things. So this is currently what our, our setup looks like that we're working with. We, um, on top of creating a BFF team and a consumer web team, we also are working very closely with our design system team. And they are, uh, they are amassing all of these um, things I mentioned before, including this React component library, um, which we consume and we use inside of our application, which is really cool. Um, eventually, we want our mobile app teams to use the design system too. So they can read from things like color variables and uh, spacing values and yeah, fonts and other things. Um, and we will get there. So specifically, what is our design system? Well. Our design system is called Snacks. Uh, I love that name. I, I think it's a really apt name because it, it says, you know, it implies that oh, you only take a little bit and you use it, right? You take a little snack and you implement it in the code base. Um, as far as tech, we're using Storybook to house our reusable React components, um, along with documentation and uh, libraries for colors and icons and such things. Um, we have not implemented yet Frontify, but that's basically going to serve as a top-level brand management tool. And uh, we're using Zeppelin to host our mockups, and that's mainly uh, maintained by the design team. Um, so, you know, the, the, the design system team is doing such a great job that I, I felt like giving you a, a little peek into what our design system looks like. Um, we have things like this is our, what our icon library looks like, right? And we have the names of the icons, and this is the, the, the string that you would pass to the icon component to properly render the, the icon. And we have things like sizes and colors. Um, we have you know, our, our color library with the name, the hex value, the export name, and the color itself. Uh, we have, of course, the component library. So this is our, uh, our reusable button components and uh, the, the various uh, implementations you can do, such as you know, block level button, disabled button, default button. Um, and of course, we have um, uh, implementation details. Which props do you need to pass to these React components to make it do exactly what you want it to do? And of course, documentation as well. Uh, so I come back to this uh, diagram 
just so you can uh, see where the design system sits in all of this. So again, this is the ideal that we're working towards. Um, and so, yeah, the design system would pass, uh, you know, design components or variables or fonts or whatever it is to uh, the iOS app and the Android app, as well as the web application. Um, so, how are we going to do this? How are we going to implement all this stuff? This seems like a lot of work, right? So, we could have done a full rebuild. Um, you know, that always is kind of the, f the first thing you think of. But we decided that um, this would, number one, take too long. And it would uh, pose a significant risk to the business. And we didn't want to accept that risk. So, what we decided is that we're going to go on a page-by-page -page basis. So uh, phase one of this migration project is um, rebuilding the menu page of Leaferondo, as well as the, uh, the checkout page and process. Um, so, so yeah, we would, we would build out these pages. And then um, as they're ready to uh, go into production, what we would do is we would gradually route users to the, the new page. Right? And as we uh, build the next new page, we do the same thing. And so what this does is it allows us to take out and isolate each uh, page, which you can treat as a subdomain, right? a specific bounded context within our domain. And uh, the, the idea is that later on, we can uh, assign teams to these specific contexts, right? So there can be a team specifically for the menu page that maintains the menu page. There can be a team that uh, handles the whole checkout process. Um, and this is something we're striving for and something we want to get to. Um, so some pros of this. Uh, the staged rollout uh, poses a uh, low risk to the business. Um, the, the modern stack makes it easier for hiring, because um, as we all know, JavaScript is the most popular programming language in the world for the seventh year in a row, according to Stack Overflow. Um, we have the business domain separation, uh, which allows us to scale development by that domain, and we, we create weak dependencies between domains. And of course, we implement things like the back end for front end and the design system, uh, which we already went over. And as far as cons, not all of the engineers can get on board for the first migration steps. Um, the team would just be too large, and it, it wouldn't work. But uh, we have uh, plans in place to um, onboard them later on when we're ready to do so. Um, the full site migration will take time. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, it could take over a year. And uh, in the meantime, we need to maintain both platforms. Right? So as we're building the consumer web, we also have to have our, our existing front end teams handling the existing website. And that uh, requires resources from the company. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, we're, we're really excited about this project. Um, and we think we're, we're going to give a better experience for our users, um, but also a better experience for our developers, and uh, a more performance website. And we're really looking forward to all of this. So if there is a single takeaway to, to take from this talk, I think it should be the importance of designing and carefully thinking about your uh, infrastructure. So whatever you build, hopefully, will last for years. And sooner or later, you have to change it. So forget it, and you regret it. So this is our story. If you want to know more, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you very much.